for this closed door session on digital, digi digitalizing MSMEs and rural women, insights and opportunities. We are very glad to see so many of you here. This closed door session will look, into hi look to highlight some of the existing innovations and initiatives to digitalize financial services to small and medium businesses in South Asia and the lessons learned about effective models that can truly impact rural women micro entrepreneurs while contributing to robust economic growth. This session will be moderated by Patsy and Lo. Can I uh, call upon you to introduce our special guest and then start the panel. Thank you very much and good afternoon. Good evening everybody, or oh, good afternoon. I think uh, most of us feel like it's been a hectic day with a lot of uh, networking and, and downloading and learning. So let's keep this session collegial and uh, interactive and conversational so that we are able to end the day uh, with uh, high levels of energy. So my name is Pat Sian. Uh, I am the uh, Inclusive Impact and Sustainability Head for Asia Pacific for Visa, Visa Worldwide. Uh, and because I am uh, running the Asia Pacific portfolio, I am based in Singapore uh, as our Asia Pacific hub. However, um, always have uh, an eye on what's happening in South Asia, in particular also what's happening with India. So we're very, very happy today to be here to share a little bit more um, about what our panelists uh, have to say, about what does it take uh, to effectively support the digitalization of um, MSMEs, and in particular uh, women-run MSMEs uh, in South Asia, looking at examples from India, Bangladesh, as well as um, other initiatives that our panelists are working on. Um, I want to set the stage by saying that we are no longer really, and I think we all agree on this, talking about why should we support women uh, run businesses or why should we support MSMEs. We know the statistics, we know what um, women run MSMEs, we know what the MSME sector writ large is contributing to economy, to sustainable development. So it's no longer a question of why, today we'd like to talk about how. So let's talk a little bit about what are some of the lessons learned, what were the insights that we may have gained. Uh, from uh, what our panelists have to share today, and also where are the opportunities for uh, the, all of us here representing philanthropic capital, private sector resources, um, and other forms of uh, corporate resources, and how can we contribute towards the growth of entrepreneurship by women, the growth of micro-entrepreneurship um, in this region, and uh, we have several different perspectives to share with you today. So. Um, I'd like to, first of all, uh, welcome our special guest, um, Ms. Anna Roy, Senior Advisor in Niti Ayog, whom many of you would know. Um, Ms. Roy is here today to share with us a little bit about uh, her perspective as well. Um, we're working with the government to advance the work with uh, the growth of uh, women entrepreneurship. Um, and, you know, Visa Foundation has supported AVPN to set up an MSME task force that is aligning with the ongoing policy conversations at the G20, starting with Indonesia, now carrying on to India's chairmanship, um, India's presidency, uh, and will be ongoing, uh, we hope, in the future as well as the presidency moves on to other parts of the world. Um, and we're excited that uh, this task force is going to be also in conversations with Ms. Roy to about how we can see more of this work grow using India's uh, acti uh, activities and uh, agenda here as a way to keep the rest of the ecosystem engaged with this very important priority. So Ms. Roy, if I may invite you to share a bit of your perspectives. Thank you. Uh, good evening, and uh, I would like to thank the organizers for, uh, for uh, accommodating me at the last moment. There was some confusion. Uh, so my name is Anna Roy. I'm senior advisor in Niti Ayog, and I head the vertical uh, that, which deals with uh, data and uh, emerging technology. Uh, in 2015, the Digital India move, uh, mission was uh, launched. And since then, a uh, few of uh, the uh, pillars of uh, using technology in various sectors has been uh, first, inclusion, second, interoperability and openness, third, outcome. And uh, this is what has defined the uh, uh, progress that India has made and today uh, as it takes the presidency of G20 we are offering to the world a unique model of governance which is public digital goods, public digital infrastructure which is premised on uh, these principles. Uh, we are able to relate it to something like the India stack, 
and digital payment revolution which we ushered in, but that is now a past. We have moved on a long uh, way. Now we are in MSME, we are in education, we are in health, using the same <coughs> governance model. Uh, today, uh, it is about MSME, and I would like to uh, kind of uh, refer to an article, a news report which came in Hindustan Times two days back, which talks about a uh, decision to set up uh, bespoke <coughs> digital banks, full stack digital banks to cater to the needs of MSME. And it was so heartening because this is the recommendation which one of our publications from Neeti made when, uh, uh, you know, we worked on digital banking and the uh, blueprint going forward. And this is what we had said that this is the uh, sector which is not being catered by PSBs presently and look at technology uh, uh, and how do you leverage technology to cater to MSMEs. So hopefully this will see light of the day sometime. And this is what I mean, overcoming access barrier, overcoming information asymmetry using technology. So technology not for, the, uh, uh, for its own purpose, but what it can achieve the outcome. Here I will be uh, kind of referring to Women Entrepreneurship Platform something which we incubated and launched in 2018. I will not go through each slide. Basically, uh, this is a initiative which is on public-private partnership, talks about collaboration, talks about convergence, and not having yet another scheme or a program. Because studying the ecosystem, I saw that everybody seems to be working in silos. Nobody talks to each other. In conferences, you meet and learn about such great work happening, but there is no convergence at the end of the day. So this platform tries to address that. First of all, convergence and collaboration. Second, uh, in my view, uh, women empowerment, we will achieve a lot of that by simply giving the right information seamlessly at the right time to women. Providing information itself empowers women more than that. I know there are behavioral issues, but this, in my view, forms the crux of the whole uh, aspect of women empowerment. So that is the second thing which WEP does. It overcomes information asymmetry, and how does it do it? A, leveraging technology. Uh, you have Facebooks, Googles of the world using AI ML to reach out to their constituency. We are using the same technology to provide smart matchmaking and provide the right inf relevant information uh, to the beneficiaries or to the users. Second, content development. Reach out to the ecosystem, uh, cull out the relevant content, and upload it on the platform. So today we have mapped uh, about 77 central government schemes, more than 400 state government schemes, which had some entrepreneurial uh, component and mapped it to the uh, specific needs, whether finance, scaling, marketing, branding, in that manner. Secondly, we have mapped, which I, in my limited knowledge, has not been done in the country so far, Almost 1,000, uh, I don't think we have completed 1,000, but we are very far ahead in accomplishing that target. Incubators and accelerators. We really do not have any, uh, you know, if I want to start my business tomorrow, I don't know where to go. So we have mapped these incubators and accelerators and so that what kind of help they can provide to the constituency, that is the second part. In the third part, now we are reaching out to various organizations and seeing what work they are doing. Uh, and that will also be mapped on the platform. Next, we are mapping all kinds of events that are taking place so that there is discovery of these things happening. And people who get to know uh, about these can participate and benefit from these events. And it is a win-win for both the sides. So, uh, overcoming information asymmetry. Second, uh, you know, leveraging the technology. So basically, uh, developing the ecosystem through collaboration, convergence, uh, and working together, uh, and uh, not uh, reinventing the wheel. Uh, at the at at 
uh, at every junction. So we don't have any scheme for funding. We don't have any scheme for marketing. We don't have any scheme for skilling. But what we are doing is trying to build uh, integrated and cohesive programs which can provide uh, uh, you know, um, targeted information uh, to the uh, constituents. Uh, lastly, I think one of the things which is missing is research in this area. Research is happening, but that also, you know, you'll have some IMF report, you'll have some ADB report, you'll have some UN report, which nobody reads really. So we are trying to uh, uh, undertake uh, research and trying to, uh, you know, provide the research recommendations and outcomes in a manner which are easily consumable. Not a big, thick report which will be there on your bookshelf and nobody will read it, nobody will remember it. So today in this cyber-physical age, it's all about communication. Technology gives us a lot of power to overcoming access as well as other, uh, you know, barriers. But we need to uh, develop the collaterals in the manner that we can reach out to the, uh, uh, to the constituents and beneficiaries in that uh, uh, using the technology in a very, very specific, targeted manner. Now, at the end, uh, this deck has been shared with all of you. Please uh, go through it. This deck is basically for partner onboarding and how each of your organizations can collaborate with WEP and strengthen our hands so that we can, uh, you know, uh, take you to, uh, we, today we have more than 27,000 registered users and uh, hopefully going forward now that we have a very robust team on the ground, we hope to increase that number uh, with, uh, uh, with a great margin. So that number will increase. So you will get a captive audience for all your programs. The audience will get a curated program from, uh, you know, when we uh, provide all this information in a manner where through smart mat matchmake, I don't get a data dump, but I only get the relevant data to me, for, for me. And going forward, also, my purpose of coming to AVPN was giving it a global hue. This is a public digital good. And like in others, uh, like UPI, you must have heard, has been now been taken to 10 countries. We hope that WEP can also be taken to other constituencies. And I hope AVPN could be a partner for uh, doing that. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Ms. Roy. And, and I think the, the key themes that have just emerged from your sharing, um, convergence, because we know that there are also many different kinds of services and support for the entrepreneurship movement at different stages of the life cycle. Um, we're talking about recognizing the diversity of needs and profiles of entrepreneurship, uh, in, especially in a market as uh, a diverse and as huge, massive as uh, what India represents. Um, and then last but not least, the need for engaging with different forms of partnerships and support from the private sector uh, alongside government to enable the kind of success that we're talking about. So thank you for kicking us off. Um, we now want to bring a little bit more color and meat to what had also just been shared uh, by Ms. Roy. I welcome all of you to please uh, and, uh, engage with the deck and also to reach out uh, to AVPN uh, as well as Ms. Roy for uh, any interested next steps. Um, but I think what's really interesting now is uh, to really hear from also practitioners on the ground and some of the programs that you've run. Um, what are the takeaways uh, also of these uh, experiences that you've had in um, empowering women micro-entrepreneurs, uh, bringing them to this journey of digitalization? So may I invite our panelists to please join us? Um, could I have Susan Bakhtul from Industry Crafts Foundation, um, Mr. Madan Padaki from um, Global Alliance for Mass Entrepreneurship, but normally you're known as GAME, am I correct? Yes, please have a seat. And then last but not least, Ms. Saksha, um, Sakshi Chata from uh, UNCDF, please join us, thank you. Okay, I know it's the last session of the day, but let's give him a round of applause. This is uh, not easy holding forth in the last session of the day, so thank you very much for joining us. Okay, uh, we have to share one microphone. So it's, it's like, you know, the witches, they're sharing an eye and then about what are they, some of the important factors for truly scalable efforts, but not without recreating the wheel, not without overlapping, bringing streamlined um, impact 
uh, and, and effect from the programs that we run. Now, each of you represent a slightly different perspective on this journey about digitalizing um, entrepreneurs. Um, and in, uh, in many of our cases, also working very directly with women micro-entrepreneurs. So maybe what I'll do is ask, um, uh, I'll start with uh, you, Susan, uh, as, as the first, since you're at the end of the, of the bank of chairs here, we'll start with you. Um, tell us a little bit about how the work that you've done in ICF been engaging with the digitization journey of women micro-entrepreneurs. We know you work with women artisans. Um, in, in very uh, rural and underserved areas as well. Some of the uh, surprising insights or maybe some of the assumptions that didn't hold true or myths that have been busted. Share with us a little bit more about that journey, please. Okay. Um, shall I introduce myself a little bit? Yes? Yeah. Uh, I'm Susan. I work with uh, Industry Foundation. This was founded in 2000. Uh, we have uh, so far impacted about 500,000 lives of women uh, by skilling them and given a market connect for about 58 million US dollars, we kind of work on a 6C module, uh, which um, the first C is construct, where we aggregate women who come in and, you know, we kind of skill them. Then it is the capacity, that is the next C where uh, we build capacity on hard skills and soft skills life skills, financial liter literacy, gender uh, equality, those kind of trainings. Um, and uh, after that is um, the channel part, the market part, because we believe that once you skill somebody, you have to give them a market connect because we don't want them to go back to, to wherever they came from, from the poverty side of point of view. Uh, when we are looking at uh, channel, we want to be a little further in the market. Therefore, we have something called the create where we, we design products and we put this out into the market. Then we, uh, we have um, capital, which is very, very important for us to kind of take it forward. Then we have the connect piece, which we are right now talking about, you know, connect, <coughs> digitize the whole thing, the whole curriculum, things like that. And when we talk about this, this has been a journey. It's not as if we started with all the six C's at uh, uh, day one. It has been a journey and now we feel that all the six have to start at one time. If there is a drop of something, one of the C's, then you know it's not gonna be a success. While we were doing all this, I mean, we were skilling, we were doing construct, we were doing capacity and all that. And when you look at our numbers of 500,000 women, Right now, we have 10,000 women actually working with, uh, under our value chains. Then what happened was COVID hit us. You know, when COVID hit us, it was uh, an overnight shutdown. You know, that overnight, we could not reach out to villages. We could not go to the uh, places where the women were working. We just could not do anything. We are, uh, one of our buyers is IKEA, and they supported us by helping us to let the women work from home. They don't have to come to the unit. So they, um, they were support, very supportive. But of course, you know, the documents and things like that um, went up, I think, 100 times because of the tracking. Now, what do we do when in a COVID situation, you can't move from your homes. We were all working from home. They are working from home. What do you do? That is when we said that digitize the whole thing. You know, and, and for us sitting in Bangalore, it was very simple to say, Acha, digitize, do that. So that was another thing that we knew, the, these women, when we spoke to them over the phone, we knew that there is a smartphone in the family, but it doesn't belong to the woman. It just doesn't belong to the woman. And it was for us, it was like, I mean, how is that possible? Because that was what, the first shock that we got that uh, the woman does not own a smartphone. So the immediate priority for, for us was take some smartphones to them. We sent the smartphones, we could not, of course, afford 10,000, but we gave them, you know, village to village. And then we started doing curriculums on the smartphone. We did uh, all the programs on the smartphone. We, when they were weaving uh, our products, we were sitting here and watching it on the, on the thing. So that was the start of our uh, digitization, you know. And the myth was that it's, it can be so simple. Uh, the other thing what we did, and this was, a, uh, this was an idea which came out from one of our colleagues, they said that to make them interested in looking at something, what we did, we, we took a regional play, 
you know, in Kannada, in Tamil, and we enacted that play and made them, you know, feel that, you know, it's okay to be watching a smartphone and watching this play. So that was a great thing for us. Yeah. Thank you so much, Susan. And, and I think I wanted to pick up one interesting point and then uh, uh, bring that as a question for both Madan and Sakshi. Um, which is that as you're speaking, what I'm realizing is that not only is there, uh, are there implications and nuances behind the level of digital literacy and readiness yes. Yes. on the part of the women artisan and, and the micro entrepreneur, but there is also the other end, which is the marketplace and what is it ready for and how do we engage with them. So maybe I could ask uh, both uh, Madan and, and, and uh, Sakshi to comment on this. Perhaps Madan, from the perspective of how do you work on the digital readiness of the entrepreneur and, and knowing that it's not necessarily one profile of a mass entrepreneur, as your as organization name may imply, it's actually quite nuanced because there's many profiles of entrepreneurship that may exist. And then to you, actually talk a little bit about perhaps what happens with the marketplace. Um, you know, in the COVID environment, marketplaces were digitized overnight. What are the implications then and how do e-commerce platforms and digital marketplaces play a role? Maybe we'll start with you, Amanda, and then sure, we'll come uh, to you. But, yeah. Again, uh, thanks for having me on this panel. It's wonderful to exchange notes, and we've had a terrific conversation in a run-up to this, so looking forward to this. Uh, I just want to tell, uh, give two stories okay, to probably reset the context a bit. One, in 2018, I met a lady filmmaker who had gone to a small town in Punjab called Govindgarh. And she had put together a, a documentary, 15-minute documentary, of a housewife who along with tending the cows and getting the dairy business going, in a span of six months, from scratch, this 12 standard dropout women had built a complete cryptocurrency Bitcoin mining infrastructure in her home. <laughs> she has actually learned the whole thing on YouTube. She bought all the servers, connectors, everything from Amazon. And six months, she's mining bitcoins in Govindgarh, right next to the cow shed. <laughs> right? You should see the video. It's mind-blowing. And how did she get to know? She said, I was just watching YouTube. Somebody said cryptocurrency is going to be the new thing. So she started every day. I started learning. And I said, let me start with something. She, in six months, figured the whole thing out. Okay? So it's, that's one, one part. The other part where I've had a personal experience is about three months ago, Right now, as we speak, there's a village in uh, Mandia district called Kyathanali. <coughs> Kyathanali is a village of around 10,000 population. Right now, as we speak, there are three women entrepreneurs who are sitting at home, who have procured an Oculus Quest 2 headset uh, at the Rural Enterprise Run. We've launched the world's first ever metaverse for rural consumers. Mm -hmm. We've onboarded a complete EV showroom into the metaverse uh, with a sales guy logging in from Chennai interacting with customers in real time, Bangalore and Chennai. And the consumers, the entrepreneurs there have, the only role that they do is they bring in customers, they go door to door. It's like an internet cafe, they run a metaverse cafe. You go in, you enter the metaverse, uh, you of course experience it, you fall off uh, Burj Khalifa or whatever. And then you enter the EV showroom, you experience the bikes. And if you're interested, then they pass on the lead to the dealer and in the, last six in the last three months, we've done about 7,000 sessions. Uh, only for tier three, tier, I mean, at the Catherine equivalent levels. About 800 leads have been generated. 20 bikes have been sold. These entrepreneurs are making anywhere from two to 5,000 rupees a month. And that number will only go up as we bring more brands into the mall. So what I'm trying to think here is, maybe the digitalizing or digitization is at the extreme end of the pyramid. Right? As a group, how do we dream about technologizing women entrepreneurs and, and MSMEs? Right? In the age of chat GPT, AI, I was just reading a, a, a story about a woman who's actually created a complete storybook using chat GPT and an AI graphics tool. And within two days, uh, a storybook has been created. So I'm trying to rethink and push the boundaries here to say, well, of course, digit digitizing is the first step. Sometimes it becomes self-limiting to say that's what we will end with. Maybe we start with there, but can we throw open the opportunities? And imagine a world where women entrepreneurs, <laughs> MSMEs are able to use new age technologies. I mean, take IoT in healthcare, IoT in agriculture, 
take 3D printing, take drones. I mean, these are all technologies just around the bend. Right? Before we even you know they'll become mainstream. And how do we leverage those technologies to really empower women and MSMEs to embrace them? And I, I think uh, yeah, their beliefs are only limited by our messaging. If we go and say, no, you can't do it, they will not do it. But if we go and say, hey, what's so great about it, just try it. It's fascinating how fast they adapt to these technologies. So I'll pause there and... I'm going to come back even a challenge on that statement because I think there is probably a lot that we are thinking about in terms of where are the risks and the opportunities sure. um, when we're bringing uh, uh, these really cutting edge opportunities to um, communities whom we may assume will be ready or not mm -hmm. be ready. Let's talk about what it takes to make sure that we can bust those assumptions and be ready. Um, so we'll come to that. Yeah. But a significant player in that conversation will, of course, have to be the digital providers and, exactly. and the company, exactly. uh, digital platforms that are in between these conversations, yes. right? You can't talk about Meta first without talking about Meta, exactly. and et cetera, et cetera. Exactly. Who, anybody from Meta here? No? OK. Google, Amazon? <laughs> Trying my luck? <laughs> OK. All right, maybe not. All right, but let me talk to you, uh, Sakshi, about this. Because you worked uh, in this uh, project that uh, Visa also collaborated with UNCDF on in Bangladesh with e-commerce platforms and the role that they play here. Um, and I can see relevance of both what Susan shared and what Madan shared in terms of what e-commerce platforms can do. Tell us a little bit more about this project and also what were some of your insights about how that inter um, integrated the um, integrated with uh, MSMEs and what were the impact of that project? No, sure, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, AVP and Pat, for having me here. It's a pleasure to be sitting here with Sudan Madan and you, uh, My name is Sakshi, Sakshi Chadha, and I work with UNCDF, which is United Nations Capital Development Fund. I lead the operations in Bangladesh for the Inclusive Digital Economy team. Um, I, I just want to maybe in a line or two talk about what we do, because sometimes, you know, that sort of gets bloody, and, and then it's easier to explain about our work. Uh, so United Nations uh, Capital Development Fund is UN's development finance arm, as the C and the D in the name indicate. And we have a very market systems focused approach to moving forward. This is an approach I think we've been hearing about in multiple sessions, uh, which essentially means that uh, as UNCDF, we work with private sector or we enable private sector to pick up something and then run with it in a sustainable manner. We try and not do interventions where we go in, we give you some money, we give you some grant, uh, and you know, wherein once we are done with the money that's in my pocket, uh, the, the objective and the work here is done. Uh, you know, I mean, we don't as much as look at what we were able to achieve. Just linking that piece to, I think, the point that uh, Patterson was making here. Uh, so going back uh, to, let's say, the time frame when COVID had just hit the markets, and this is Bangladesh uh, I'm talking about at that time. Uh, you know, Bangladesh has a huge reliance on MSMEs. Uh, many in the South Asian uh, countries actually do. Uh, more than 25% of the country's GDP sort of is dependent on the MSMEs. Uh, and uh, they actually call it CMSMEs, which is cottage, micro, medium, and small enterprises. It can be that small. There's a new C, uh, you know, uh, yeah. Um, so, so just think about those enterprises. And then suddenly there comes this COVID-19 pandemic. Nobody knows about it. And, and there are regulations and there are legislations which say no movement, no shops can open. Uh, and you know, it's just everybody shutting down. Uh, it, it's so much more easier for all of us. We have laptops, we have phones, we have internet connections. So just tomorrow I log in uh, you know, with maybe my password got lost, but I, I can get that help. So it's so easy for me to transition, but continue to do what I was doing and get my salary at the end of the day. Uh, but now think about these MSMEs. Uh, you know, they don't know when the markets were open. Uh, the lockdowns were one day, two day, one week, two week. But then they were three months, then they were a lot longer. Then there was second wave, there was third wave. So I think that's the time frame that uh, this conversation and the support uh, from Visa came in where we started working uh, more actively with MSMEs. Uh, we'd been working with them in Bangladesh under the MDDRM project with support from the European Union. But, uh, but you know, that's when we sort of realized we really need to do some kind of work in collaboration and partnership wherein these people could be brought onto the online ecosystem quite soon. We don't have time to wait. We can't say, fine, let's do a three month long online training or offline training. We needed immediate quick fixes. So that's when this Build Back project was sort of uh, you know, thought through. And obviously many partners came in, uh, thanks to Visa for their general support for this piece as well. How we went about it, uh, you know, from the work that we've done on the ground and the, the whole market systems development approach, what we do know is uh, none of us, even us actually, uh, while we all want to enroll for many courses, I do that three, four every year some from Coursera, some in executive, you know. Uh, but do I really finish them? No, that doesn't happen. My success rate is really low. Then do we expect these people, these smaller MSMEs who might have a smartphone and not have a smartphone to do it? 
I mean, why? What is important uh, when designing such pieces is to think about adult learning principles. You and I are only interested in things when there is a recency and there is relevance for us. And that was a perfect opportunity because they can't go and open you know, their offline stores and, and this will suddenly impact their earnings on a day-to-day -day basis, a perfect opportunity to say, go through ABC, or learn these skills, or go to these capabilities, and then come onto a platform. So we partnered with Xshop and Shopa. These are two of the biggest e-commerce providers in Bangladesh, uh, both startups, actually. Mm, and, and our intention with them was because it's not just offering them trainings and content that, you know, uh, how to use a mobile, how to sell your products online, how to create your profile. Uh, imagine on Amazon if somebody has to sell some product, what all they have to go through. So these trainings were really that specific to be able to do this. But what's in it for the e-commerce providers? Uh, you know, obviously they wanted more and more share of the market. They really want to tap onto this market, but they didn't have the means, the skill set. Or even, you know, this is then not their core skill set. They are not educational institutions. Uh, so I think it's really important that, that we sort of realize that uh, everybody comes with their own skill set. MSME skill, uh, sorry, e-commerce provider skill set here was that they have the reach and they have the element of recency. That if you if you go through trainings with them, you can then get listed onto their platform and start selling these products and services right away. So I think that's the loop that we were able to leverage. Uh, you know, go through these four or five basic modules, go to these. That is an incentive for the uh, e-commerce providers to say yes. Now that you understand ABCD, you're well prepared and equipped to actually start selling or and, you know sort of being on a platform. And I know I, I took a longer example, so happy to pause here, Pat, or, or I can share a few learnings as you suggest. Definitely come back to you, don't worry. Um, but I, I think what I want to take away from that is that, uh, firstly, that there was, uh, it was important that any form of upskilling or capacity building that we're thinking of uh, has the element of recency, and also that there needs to be an economic incentive to do it, right? And so the digital marketplaces were critical uh, uh, enablers of that. Um, but then coming back to something that Susan mentioned earlier, because you talked about IKEA, um, you know, the, the importance of looking at really how else will the micro-entrepreneur then be enabled to participate in a value chain, and is the value chain also ready to be uh, partners on this digitization journey, right? Um, tell us a little bit more about where else you saw um, other players in the ecosystem needing to be ready for this digitalization, and what can they do to support that? Yeah, when we were looking at it, it is very easy to look at compartments, yeah, and um, that's the kind of mistakes one would do, you know, then there is no continuity, there is, I mean, somebody falling off the grid. So, uh, definitely when we are looking at it, we are looking at manufacturing, we are looking at the marketplace, we are looking at how do you do the logistics, everything has to come in place at the same time. Yeah, and um, uh, with digitization, when the woman producer who is also managing the whole business, if she cannot see uh, what is happening to my product after this, then she's kind of failing to understand why she's doing this thing. So there has to be a continuity and when we are looking at it, we are trying to see that if the whole value chain is on a digital platform, uh, we sitting far away, you know, uh, the producer sitting in Madurai saying that, okay, now where are my goods? Are they at the seaport? Are they at the airport? Where is it? So definitely it's a whole chain of uh, things and it's not, and it is not simple and we're still learning. We're still learning to put this whole pieces together because there are different players which come in who are managing logistics, who are managing production and things like that. So for us, it is very important that this whole thing comes on to one ERP system where everybody can see what is happening, you know, and gain from that. At the end of the day, you know exactly what is happening, you know. I think that's, that's, that's really, uh, my, my big takeaway from what you just said is that the value chain is on that same journey, on the same system yes, with you. Yes. But I will now come back to Madan because I said I'll come back to you and challenge yeah, that yeah, assumption, yeah. right? So, okay. I can imagine if I was looking at a, uh, a particular uh, handicraft or a particular uh, product, right? Uh, it could be an agricultural commodity or mm -hmm. something. And there's a certain value chain that, that is associated with that, which of course on the one end you have the micro-entrepreneur and you have all the other intermediaries and off-takers and wholesalers, and then eventually maybe a large corporate right. buyer or somebody like that at the other end of that. 
along the way, there's still a lot of brick and mortar yeah. implications. Yeah. Now, we can talk about digital platforms that will facilitate intermediation in the marketplace, but you are talking about metaverse. You're talking about Oculus. How do we bring the rest of the value chain into that level of high tech that we're talking about? Sure. Maybe there are, uh, let me take it in two angles there. One is, uh, see, the, the, the exemplars that we need to create today, uh, it's going to take a long time to evolve. I mean, by the time we, you know, I, what I'm saying is in, in the order of magnitude of a few years, today an Oculus device itself is so expensive, yes. right? It requires a 5G network. But let's take, in a, let's zoom forward a few years from now. I mean, who would have thought that even though a smartphone access for women is still a challenge, but if I was sitting in 2006 and were envisioning how life would have changed now in smartphones, we would have found it quite hard to accept that, listen, I can book tickets, I can, I can watch a movie on my phone, Right, so I'm maybe the order of magnitude of pace of change will uh, change. I come back to the point that well, we will have to do all the heavy lifting that we have to do to bring brick and mortar, get the value chain, all that is given. How do we start shining the spotlight on exemplars that are already there in different parts of the country and showing what is possible? Right, and eventually they will become the norm. Now, in this, as you rightly said, we need to get the big daddies in the game. Of course, as, as Ms. Anna Roy was saying, the government has to come in and, and play a role in kind of creating that facilitating infrastructure. Uh, philanthropic organizations are to come in and say, hey, what new can we show? I think the, the project that you talked about is fascinating. In fact, just to add, uh, we've just gotten a pro partnership going with BMGF to work with four of the largest portals in the country, uh, the e-commerce portals, and to really look at the portals from a product perspective their own product design, UX, UI perspective to say, how can you make it easier for women to access as sellers, mm -hmm. right? What are the inherent biases that have crept in into the platforms, uh, which are making it more difficult for women to be, uh, you know, effective on these platforms. Mm -hmm. So it's a one year project that we're doing at every element of the onboarding to selling, to settlements, to stuff like that. So I think uh, we have to take a whole of society approach here. Uh, Everyone has a role to play. And if we can start uh, creating some examples which give us that aha to say, yeah, this is also possible, maybe in three years or four years, this small spark that we ignite will catch fire. Right? So that's the thing. The other point I want to uh, share, and this is, we, we again spoke about it briefly, is see, there's been several experiments. You take the hole in the wall experiment, which was done almost 20 years ago by this professor who put just a computer in the in literally a hole in the wall. Yeah. And within a few days, he had seen kids. You know, at Head and Life Foundation, we take literally zero educated village youth, and in six months' time, they're able to be computer literate, confident youngsters. So I think one of the things we must do right now uh, is to start embedding this idea of digital first and entrepreneur first right in our schools and colleges. Right? Delhi government is a classic case and example where entrepreneurial mindsets curriculum is taught to every kid from 6th standard to 12th standard. A million school kids are going through an entrepreneurship mindsets curriculum the last three years and the results have been stunning. We are hearing stories about young people during COVID who started their own enterprises because their parents were out of business, right? We are hearing women, uh, uh, you know, young women coming and pitching in front of the deputy chief minister, whatever. So I think right. if we can build an environment which fosters this thinking, and we celebrate such entrepreneurs and, and this platform could be a fantastic way to showcase some success stories. Uh, then we can open up the realm of what's possible. It's right. going to be hard, right. but I think if we all push together, right. it, it will work. Sounds like we need to, first of all, also identify where are the shining stars and exactly. the exemplars, as you say, exactly. right? So in, exactly. in, that, in that context, um, I'd like to also ask the audience, if now is the time to raise your hands. If you have questions, please we'll pass the microphone around. Um, and you know, give, give a thought, actually, about where do you think would be uh, opportunities for us to particularly showcase successful innovations, mm. pilots, um, that are really the harbinger of what can come. Um, in, in the digitalization journey of the MSME. Um, why is that important? Because if we're talking about really trying new ways to scale up mm. the value chain involvement yeah. in digitalization, in, as what Susan had shared, if we're really trying to find new ways to, to not only 
benefit from the scale of digital mm. platforms, but also realizing that within that scale, we have to account for nuances and quite specific needs that the MSME may have. Um, and now the new term that I learned today, the CMSME may mm. have. Um, we need to really r figure out how to work with that type of technology and digital enablers to have the benefit of scale, but also be able to meet the needs of um, the unique needs of the MSMEs. Um, so, if there are any questions, please uh, raise. Uh, well, we don't really need to raise our hand, right? Just shout out because it's such a uh, it's the last session of the day, and we're all friends here. So, uh, and when yeah. people are getting ready, again, this was a story that inspired me, which yes. I shared to WhatsApp much before WhatsApp for Business came into being. Mm -hmm. 2016, I, I met a small uh, woman entrepreneur who used to run a trinket store in Gadag. Yes. And she used to travel all the way to Surat to pick up stuff. So she was just on WhatsApp. Mm -hmm. She had just got onto WhatsApp in 2015. She got a smartphone. And and in three months, you should have seen the way she expressed the way it had changed. Right? She used to say, earlier I used to take my own money, yes. go to Surat, buy stuff, yes. put it in my store and sell. Yes. She says, when I realized I could send photos on WhatsApp, she says, I used to go to Surat, send photos of all the trinkets I saw to a bunch of women in Gadar mm -hmm. and say, who likes what? Right. So she says, I could create an order catalog right there. Yes. And I used to buy only those. Mm -hmm. So I had no inventory risk. Right. right. And third, she says, the third trip I went three months later, mm -hmm. people gave me money mm -hmm. and said, you know what? I'm giving you a thousand rupees. These are the things I like. You send me the photo, you buy it right there itself. Mm -hmm. So in three months, she said, I moved from an inventory based model. And this is much before WhatsApp for Business had come into play. So what I'm trying to also say is that if we if we look for those exemplars, maybe there are already use cases. Yes. So how do we kind of right. create more? Yeah. Um, I'll invite anybody here who has some uh, uh, experiences of these kinds of exemplars that uh, Madan had just shared. You know, if you'd like to share some of the projects that you've worked on, yeah. uh, which are also showing these kinds of really interesting opportunities. Um, I will say that one of the reasons coming from a large uh, corporate one of the reasons why these exemplars are important, because it takes away the unknown mm. and the risk that may have been associated with working and empowering MSMEs. Mm. Um, to the point that Ms. Roy, you mentioned, how does information asymmetry be, uh, be dealt with, right? One certain way to, de to deal with that is to actually showcase where there are examples of success. Um, and the extent to which we can invite more private sector partners is to have more of these uh, exemplars and stories being told. Um, there's a comment here. Um, do you need a microphone? Or I think it's speak. Yeah. 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 So I don't think it's a comment, but it's a question for Susan. So you know, when you uh, provided women with the smartphones, did you also in any study capture the economic impact that had sort of before and after of providing access to the smartphones? Um, I mean, the absolute data which we wanted was that uh, they need to continue earning. Yeah. yeah? They cannot stop earning. Um, how can they earn if they, they don't have stuff at home? They are not trained on it. So that was the basis. And uh, like I told you, IKEA helped us. They did not cancel a single order. While globally people were pulling away orders and things like that, IKEA did not. So IKEA kind of gave us an extended delivery date and said that. So that was the incentive. And when we met the deliveries, when we met the deliveries on quality also, huh? it's not that we compromised quality. And of course, we took a little bit longer to deliver. That was the impact that we uh, recorded and that is our success. You know, that's how we monitored this whole thing. You know, so right from the top, it was that, of course, you know, we had an amazing buyer who kind of supported us, an amazing team on ground who said that, you know, we are there. We are not going to be sitting at home. And it also helped people not to get into depression. You know, because every day we would talk to them. Yeah. And there were simple questions. How are you? How is your family? You know, and those are the things that we did. Yeah, and at the end of the day, that was the matrix. One, one of the things that I wanted to talk about, just very briefly, and I want to come back to you, Sashi, and again, uh, comments welcome from the audience is that as we look at this type of digital empowerment of the MSMEs, we sometimes uh, may not yet have captured the ripple effect of that kind of empowerment, right? I mean, on average, for example, based on Visa Foundation's programs in the past, every woman MSME that they would have supported has generated three more employment opportunities for others in their community. So one of the things I wanted to just ask quickly on this, and I want to ask Sakshi about this, is that the, the, the way that MSMEs have responded um, and taken advantage of these opportunities are 
um, generally in a positive direction, but we also know that there are lots of nuances about um, based on the social demographic um, uh, conditions and the geographic uh, uh, location of the community and so forth. Um, because I know you had worked with two uh, platforms and they were working differently with different yes. communities. Mm -hmm. Can you share a little bit about the nuances that you sure. saw so that we understand also that MSMEs is not just a monolithic group yeah, of people. Yeah, yeah. Please no, tell that, us. that's a great question, Fab. Thanks. Uh, no, uh, I, I think just going back to the point that I was making about the whole piece of what was done, I, I think what was important was that the intention of this entire piece was uh, to deliver skill or capability enhancement in a sustainable manner going forward, which means if the donor pulls out or if there is no free money available in the system, does this continue? And businesses should be capable and interested and find this as a potential business case, which is what we see the e-commerce is. And they are best placed to do this. And, and just uh, responding to Pat's question, actually. So there were two uh, e-commerce providers that I was talking about. One was Xshop, one was Shopper. Uh, now, I'll give you some assumptions which we started with, and they were absolutely wrong. You know, the assumption one was, this is Bangladesh I'm talking about. Uh, women would definitely not perform that well on these digital. So how did we do this was these trainings had a pre-test and a post-test. My assumption, you know, was that maybe women won't do as well uh, compared to men on these. Uh, that was absolutely wrong. Uh, you know, because both of these uh, e-commerce providers were dealing with such different demographics. One of them had urban women. Uh, their education levels were, uh, you know, I won't say they were digitally at zero, but they were digitally at, let's say, three or four. Uh, they had seen smartphones in the locality. They had been touched by government's digital Bangladesh sort of, you know, initiatives. They had accessed the union digital centers, which have been established in their unions. So they were a lot, uh, they weren't at zero. But the other one uh, that we worked with, which was Shop Up, which was actually absolutely rural remote uh, MSMEs, uh, for them, uh, uh, it was largely male. They struggled to actually have women MSMEs uh, who would come and get onboarded for this one. And, uh, and, and, and their scores were, were a lot worse than what women would have. So, you know, this was an absolute long assessment or an assumption that we started with. But, but, but I think that, that's what made us realize that this is not a homogeneous group, you know. Yeah. There is really not one solution and one way to reach them all. Uh, and, and what's interesting is actually a lot of us are homogeneous. You know, yeah. we might all be using UPI right yeah. now. So our behaviors are a lot more standard, the segment we are yeah. in. Middle, uh, you know, middle income, upper, upper middle income. And upper. But that's not the case. So therefore, when we look at a program or a solution, it really needs to be customized to their needs. Uh, and I'm sorry, Pat, I'm, I'm taking a little more time. But there was another assumption I wanted to highlight uh, that, that has been busted so many times with a lot of work that we do. Uh, in many of our projects, we go with the assumption that as long as MSME digitization happens, a bank loan would come after that. I mean, what's the big deal, you know? Now, if they've digitized their data, a bank would look at it, and they should be happy to, you know? Uh, so now I've done my part, which means they are into the formal uh, system. Uh, but that didn't work at all. And this is not just Bangladesh, but we do regional grants as well. So I'm talking about Cambodia, I'm talking about Nepal, I'm talking about Myanmar. This is not, this is not actually, this goes back to the point that Susan made, that digitization is really a very small part of the puzzle. Uh, but then how do you connect and have a more holistic solution so that, you know, exactly. bank has full visibility or a financing entity gets a lot more than just a database. Uh, and I'll, I'll just pause yeah, there. Thank you, Pat. Thank you very much for that very uh, important reminder. Um, and for all, any one of us here that is looking at MSME financing, access to capital, I know we had a session about that earlier today as well. Um, you know, I think being able to recognize that uh, there is a gap between being able to digitalize the, the MSME and actually translating that journey into information that will help and result in financing is still a journey. Um, which kind of brings us back full circle because I know that it is about time to to also let everyone go back. Um, that earlier on, uh, Ms. Roy started out the conversation with the fact that it is really important for such a platform because of convergence. Why? We need the whole value chain, private sector organizations, um, policy programs, government players, all working on the same page to truly bring that kind of value chain effect, number one. Uh, number two, we need this kind of a platform because we have to showcase stories and success, success exemplars, like you pointed out, Madan. Um, and also to be able to um, learn from these kinds of experiences and insights, right? Um, and then thirdly, because we recognize that even though there is an opportunity for scale, um, the MSME uh, community, the MSME group, um, is actually a very 
diverse, heavily nuanced, has quite a lot of different needs. Um, now, but that's not to say that we can't create a kind of scale impact because the kind of technology that you're talking about, Madan, right, being able to activate the likes of uh, what we're talking about today with uh, digitization, digital finance, even um, you know, cutting edge technology like ChatGPT and so forth, um, the opportunity for that is, uh, is quite immense. Yeah. But we have to do that in an informed manner yeah. in partnership with um, you know, all, the, all the partners that would be aware of the risk that comes with that. Um, and I could go on and on about this because I am passionate about this, but I'd like to say that we've covered a lot of ground in a very short time about the women MSME ecosystem and what does digitalization bring. I'd like to leave an ask of everyone here before we say goodbye, which is that um, we are, from, from Visa's perspective, I'm very open to hear from any one of you about what you think a private sector organization like Visa and our corporate foundation may be able to do more in so that we can support the type of gender diverse MSME systems that we're talking about today. So please feel free to um, uh, get in touch. Um, if you can't find me, the APPM people know where to find me. Um, and happy to hear from all of you. Um, Ms. Roy, would you like to say a few words to help us close out the day? So I spoke about information asymmetry. It's very interesting. Game is our partner. And I learned about a lot of their initiatives sitting here. <laughs> so this is what information asymmetry is, really. Secondly, we can't have a cookie cutter. Yeah. But the good news is that this new, uh, you know, what we call this fourth IR, mm. that presents the technology which allows us to be bespoke, yeah. which allows us to overcome access barriers, and allows us to ensure that we need not be uniformed and we can have bespoke, uh, uh, you know, responses. I would like to end with the anecdote, a very good friend and a partner of WEP is Chetna from Mandeshi. Yeah. And uh, she in a panel said, we think that uh, she, by the way, caters to the vendors, you know, roadside vendors. That is her uh, uh, constituency really. So she said, we think that uh, uh, they do not understand formal finance mm -hmm. or, you know, all that, <laughs> but they are much more intelligent than us. The fact that they are not coming to NBFCs or small finance banks because you do not meet their needs. So being user centric is the key, uh, which we try to do in all the work that we do. Look at the user, let it be a demand driven thing and not a supply driven uh, initiative and it will be a success. Thank you. Maybe a commitment that we can all take and I'll take the lead. By next year, can we have one interesting exemplar per district identified and put up on the WEP platform, right? Can we have 750 stories of women entrepreneurs and MSMEs using technology and, how, and, and what are the learnings from that, right? What can be replicated? If we can do that together, I think that will be very powerful. Excellent. So AVPN team, please make that note for next year's summit agenda yeah. and that will be something that you talk about. Thank you, everybody, for uh, uh, working with us and staying with us uh, through the, le the rest of the session. Really appreciate it. We hope to see you tomorrow. Can I just say one more oh, thing? Yes. Sorry for uh, holding you up. The deck will be shared with all of you. Please reach out. It's already up on the app. It's just app? It's on everybody's swap card. So if you just go to the swap card for this session, it's already up there. Yeah. Okay, thank you everybody. I know this topic is not really going to have an end, but uh, we do need to leave the room. So appreciate everyone's time and attention. Let's uh, continue the conversation outside in the corridors. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.